We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Well, good morning, ACC. How are you guys today? All right. Well, hey, uh, if you are joining us in person, online, or over in the lounge, we want to give you a special warm welcome and just say thanks for joining us this morning and, and uh, join with us to celebrate the Christmas season. My name's John. Um, I serve here as one of the executive pastors, and it's honestly, it's an honor to be with you guys this morning, you know. Um, watching those five baptisms and knowing that there's even another one. In fact, one of those baptisms that just happened... Uh, I got a text in between services and a few other people in the church, and they're like, hey, my son would like to be baptized. This is okay. Absolutely, it's okay. Um, and, you know, I just remember watching this. And one of the things that I love to say is, this is why we do what we do here at ACC, okay? We exist as a church to see people transformed and released by the love of Jesus, and, you know, when Pastor Matt is saying, hey, we've had record baptisms, okay, let me give you that number, okay? To date, as of today, there will have been 70 people this year who decided to get baptized. 70 people. Yeah. And we know that there's already five people who have signed up to get baptized in the weeks to come, okay? God is certainly moving. And, you know, it, it's one of those things of just watching Watching you as a church work, watching God move through you has been amazing this year. You know, one of the things that you guys more recently did was uh, at Thanksgiving, we did boxes of hope and 147 boxes were returned taking care of meals for people and taking care of Thanksgiving meals specifically that might not have happened otherwise because of your generosity, okay? Yeah. <laughs> There's just so much going on here. There's gifts and things like that that have been given to kids that wouldn't have got them and families have, who have been blessed throughout this year. And I just, I don't want you to miss what God's doing here. I don't want you to miss it because it's so often that God can be moving through us and we can miss the splendor of it all. You know, this morning, you may have even watched this, these baptisms, and you may have questions. This may be your first time even in a church, and we want you to know we're glad you're here. And if you're joining us at home and haven't been here for a while, consider this your invitation. We'd love to have you here at ACC, love to connect with you, but lives are truly being transformed and released by the love of Jesus. Well, today, we're going to continue on in our series, Great Expectations, and we're going to be talking about the expectations of a king and a kingdom, because the two are interlinked. But before we do that, let's go to the Lord with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you thanking you, thanking you that you are a God of promises and that you keep your good promises. You keep all of your promises. Father, that you give us good gifts and good things and that we truly can celebrate your son, Jesus, this day and this season. Father, I ask that you would speak to us this morning. I thank you for your amazing grace that I need just as much today as the first day that I came to know about it. I ask, Father, that you would help me to speak your word boldly and clearly. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. But you know... Um, I don't know how you set up your Christmas trees, okay, but if your tree isn't up by now, it's time to get on the ball, okay? Now, I will say, one person in, in my life group, uh, she shared that she had a bit of a strategy that I love. She never took down the tree. It just was up all year round. And so if you're trying to get ahead for next year, just leave it up. But by now, some of you have decided, you know, there's, there's different strategies for putting gifts under the tree. One of those strategies is you keep them in your room or around the house, whatever you have them there, until Christmas morning, you put them all out and it's all over. And then the rest of us, we want that stuff, 
quote unquote, out of our closets and room, right? So we put it out there and, and we take and we, we put these gifts all around. We put them all over the place, you know? And what we do is we set them there. And kids, we know what you do because sometimes as adults, we do this too. You know, you, you pick it up. How heavy is that? Does that align with what I asked for? What could this possibly be? In fact, we've got some kids here. I need your help for a moment, okay? And some of you guys, I found at the first service, you guys are kids at heart. So if you hear it, uh, I, we're going to try to identify what these gifts are, okay? Because I loved doing this as a kid, and I love it now, okay? So you're a kid, you come out, and when mom and dad aren't looking, what do you do? You pick up, you pick it up, and what do you do? You shake it, and it's? Legos, that's right, the gift that keeps on giving mom and dad as you stumble through the night and ow, you hit your toes. Or maybe it comes up in the vacuum cleaner. And then you have another gift. And you know, you get this gift and it's kind of squishy. Kids, what do you think this is? You guys are good. Yeah, it sucks. And how do I know? Because it says grandma on there. And I don't know about you guys, but growing up, grandma always gave me the best dress clothes, socks. Who knew that by high school, we start to look forward to the socks because they're going to be really cool, I hope, right? It's a thing now. But then we also have that other gift. We have that gift that, you know, we're, we're really anticipating Christmas and we get really excited and we pick it up and, oh my goodness, I broke it. Broken glass. Nobody saw that. It's, um, you know, that, 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 that's my brother's, that's my sister's gift. They won't notice. They'll be fine. They take it, take it back, right? We sometimes get ahead of ourselves. So we've got some Legos that we might stumble on. We've got some things over here that we don't know just appreciate, and some things that, quite honestly, we just break. But in the midst of it, we all have gifts that we look forward to, don't we? We have our, our list of man, I really want this. And you, you kind of give little clues here or there, you know, leave something, you know, out on the coffee table or on the back of the toilet or whatever. You put it someplace because I don't know what your gift, maybe at one time it was a Red Rider BB gun or a Nintendo 64, who knows what, you know, but you're kind of saying, hey, I have some expectations. And you know, we're not any different than the people 2,000 years ago in Jesus' day. In Jesus' day, people had expectations, good expectations, holy expectations. They had expectations of a king, a Messiah who would come, and a kingdom that he would usher in. And we, we see it when we read words like this out of Isaiah 9. We'll put the words up on the screen. Isaiah says it this way, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Who do you think he's talking about? All of us. All of us, each day, we see darkness, but, but he's coming, but he's coming. They've seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. That's when the wind comes. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdened them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors, every warrior's boot used in battle, and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. Don't miss this. He's saying, the wars are over. The battles are done. What do you do at the end? You take all the stuff, and you burn it because it's not needed any longer. There's going to be a day when we don't have to worry about wars, rumors of wars, or anything like that. And then he says these, and maybe you've heard these words at Christmas, but everything leads up to this. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of His government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne 
and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. You see, this isn't something that we're going to accomplish. It's something that God is going to accomplish. So often we try, we try in ourselves to accomplish these things. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But God is ultimately in these words saying, I'm going to do something. I'm going to send my messenger. I'm going to send the Messiah. And he's going to usher in a whole new kingdom. And for hundreds of years, generation after generation after generation, they looked forward with great expectation. They looked forward to the moment that God was going to move in their midst. And then we read, we read after hundreds of years of hearing these words from one generation to another, we hear these words out of the Gospel of John. It says in John 1, 4 through 5, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Let me go backwards. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And going to nine, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. There was this, this darkness that they all knew, that we know so often in our own lives, that we, we see it in ourselves, we see it in the world around us, we see all these things. And oftentimes, when God gives gifts, we can overlook them. We can overlook what God's wanting to give us. In fact, in that day, they did as well. Sometimes we can miss it. Kind of like down here. I've got a, one more gift in here. But I want you to first see a little bit of darkness for a moment. Can we bring down the lights for a moment here? It's dark. But you know what's good in darkness is light. And here's the thing. The book of John, the gospel of John tells us that light was coming into the world. And what do we do when we're in the darkness? We stumble around. We stumble around and yet we're told that the light, that Jesus was being sent in the world and everywhere that he went, that's where God's reign was most clearly seen. Everywhere that he went, the kingdom of God, as he says, is in your midst. Everywhere that he went, there is light. And even today, wherever his presence is, the Holy Spirit, there is light. Let's go ahead and bring up the lights. When we look at these things, we can miss it. We can miss it. But I want you to hear very clearly, God does not want us to miss it. And so turn out the lights one last time. Within this, it's kind of like when I was a kid. I remember there was a spotlight that would go back and forth and back and forth throughout, everywhere, everywhere around the city. It was very clear there is some place that I should be right now. And God is saying, listen, I don't want you to miss this. And so there's light. Go ahead and turn back light. It's always interesting trying to turn those off when there's two buttons. But the true light was coming into the world, and I love, I love the other places in Scripture. Light and darkness is talked about many, many times. In fact, the book of James, James says this in James 1.17, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. It also says in 1 John 1, 5, God is light and in him there is no darkness. John says again in Revelation 21, 23, the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and the lamb is its lamp. And when I think about these things, I think about shifting shadows. I think about how, you know, you can go to a Ravens game or something like that and you go to the night game and then, you know, if you're like me, you park someplace where you don't have to pay any money. And those are really dark, shadowy places. And so as you walk, you look for the shadows and you walk a little bit further away from the shadows, okay? Because you don't know, is somebody going to jump out of those? And God's saying, listen, you walk with me, there are no shadows. You walk with me, you will not know darkness. 
you will know light. You will know something different than this world. And when Jesus comes into the world, we are introduced to an already but not yet kingdom where he has come, but the fullness has not fully arrived, yet he is reigning. And in those first days, I think about a story about a man by the name of Simeon. We're going to find this in Luke chapter 2. Simeon, we're not told when he was told this, but Simeon was a person just like you and me. And one day, he heard something from God. You see, he had read these stories that were passed on from generation to generation, but God had revealed to him that the Lord's Messiah, that the Messiah was coming into the world and that he himself would not depart until he had seen the Messiah with his own eyes. That he would actually see the Messiah come into the world. This gift from God that so often can be looked past even today. He was told this, and then we're told that one day he was moved by the Spirit to go into the temple area. And as he moved into the temple area that he had been at many, many times before, he had seen people there. He had seen mothers and fathers and children being dedicated to the Lord. The fulfillment of the law, as it were, happening. And on this particular day, it would have been Jesus' eighth day of living. On the eighth day, he would have been brought to the temple. And in this moment, Simeon sees Jesus because the spirits led him to be there. And he sees him and he just walks right up. And as he walks up to him, he takes the child in his arms and he lifts him up. And we read these words in Luke 2, 29 and following He says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Simeon had great expectations. Israel had great expectations. We have great expectations. And there are three specific great expectations of the kingdom that they look forward to. The first expectation was the expectation of hope. Simeon had hope. There were days I'm sure that he woke up and he said, is this the day, Lord? Is this the day? But sometimes when we walk, We wonder, God, I trust your word. I trust you. But when are you doing things? I know that you'll make good on your promises. And this is why the psalmist says in Psalm 130, verse 5, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I put my hope. I tell my kids, we're called to be hope dispensers. Hope never gets old. You know why? Because we always need hope in this world, because it can be a very dark world. But in Jesus, there is hope. The second expectation that we have, expectations of freedom, expectations of freedom. In fact, we read of this. We read of this in Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. It says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Think of those first days when Jesus walked the earth. And people read this, and they heard it in the synagogue. And they would say, poor, I'm poor. Brokenhearted, I'm brokenhearted. Captive, I'm captive. I need freedom from all these things. I'm a prisoner. I have my own debts. And it's it's, it's, it's an amazing thing when you read the Scriptures and you connect point A to point B, because in this moment... In this moment, Isaiah says this hundreds of years before. And then there's a particular day that is recorded in Luke chapter 4. When Jesus comes unassumingly into the synagogue, 
on a Saturday morning, on Sabbath, and he comes in, and the scroll is laid out, and he comes up, and he begins to read these exact words that we just read. But Jesus does something a little different that day. He says, in your hearing, in this day, these words have been fulfilled. And it says, and every eye was just fixed on him. You can imagine the, the, what the tension was in the room. Like, who is this? What, 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 wrapping their minds around it. When it says the year of the Lord's favor, it's referring to the year of Jubilee. This is a, a day that we read of in the law. When all debts are paid. So for parents... For adults here, you're buying all these gifts and the credit card is racking up. Now imagine in that day, all the debts are paid. Imagine the medical debt paid. Imagine the house debt paid. Imagine all your debts paid. And yet Jesus does more than that. He does more than that. Who can pay the debt of your sin? Who can pay the debt of your darkness? You see, we can have freedom from all these things in the world, but there are debts that we can't pay on our our own even if we tried. And Jesus, when he says there is a year of jubilee, he means there is a year of jubilee. And I'm not holding anything back. There are debts that you can't pay. I will pay them myself in part now. And in the fullness of the kingdom, there will be so much more than we can imagine. The third great expectation of the kingdom was expectations of hope, or I apologize, peace, expectations of peace. It says in Isaiah 52, verse 7, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. We read these words And we read them in the comfort of our homes, the comfort of of a, a church building where we can freely worship. But in that day, in the day of Jesus, when these words would have been read, it was under what was known as the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. And if you're not familiar with the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome was there is peace for Rome and no one else. Scorched earth policy. Do what we say or we will burn your city to the ground. Does that sound like peace? No. They lived under the oppression of Rome. The world lived under the oppression and the thumb of Rome. In the day of Jesus, in the day of Jesus, there is good news that is being proclaimed. Just as it says in Isaiah 52, because... There's good news. The good news of peace is coming into the world. The good news of peace is coming through Jesus because where he is, God reigns. But it was so much more than they could have ever imagined. The peace that he offered was not a Pax Romana. It was a shalom peace. That is a peace on all sides. Now Israel, when they were looking for Messiah to come, they thought that it was going to be peace where, hey, God is going to set up a government right now and overthrow that government and this government and every government. But God had something more. He will do that. But even before that, then and now and until Jesus comes back, we are given good news of peace. Peace on all sides where we can be at peace with people on our right, people on our left, with God that we can have peace internally. Oh, God wants that for you so much. He wants you to have that hope. He wants you to have that freedom and that peace from all your hurts, your habits, your hang-ups, from that darkness, from those things that you struggle with day in and day out. God wants peace for you. And here's the thing. In Isaiah, it says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. 
And Paul, an early follower of Jesus in Romans chapter 10, verse 15, he talks about how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And the good news is that God has sent Jesus into the world, that God has sent the Messiah into the world. And for some of you, you may be like, man, John, you haven't seen my feet. You have not seen my feet. My feet, they're, they're, they're kind of, you know, they're, they're kind of ugly. They're kind of going back and forth. I've got one toe going over the other. I've got a little foot fungus, whatever. Some of you dudes go to the gym and you got athlete's foot. I know. I know the pain. But God's word says, if you are sharing the good news of the gospel, you have beautiful feet. Okay, look at your neighbor and say, I got beautiful feet. I got beautiful feet. If you are sharing the gospel, you got beautiful feet is what it says. But here, clearly, that so often in this world, there are ways that we attempt to create hope, freedom, and peace. And they did it in the first century, just as we do today. There's four particular ways that we attempt to create hope, peace, and freedom. The first one is religion. We try to do this with religion. Now, that sounds a little strange to be talking about that in a church, doesn't it, sometimes? In a church building? Isn't, isn't that what this is supposed to be about religion? Do this, don't do that. But here's the thing. Religion is a system of do's and don'ts. What we're talking about here is good news that God sent His Son into the world to do what we couldn't do on our own, to die in our place. It's not about what you do. It's about what he's already done. And all we have to do is recognize it. That's all we're asked to do. Just recognize it. Have faith that he's done it. But in the first century, there was a group known as the Pharisees, and this is exactly what they did. They were in the city, and actually, the word Pharisee, it literally, the proper um, translation of it, as far as the root of it, means separate. It's the idea of being separate. So they were in the city. They were with everybody, but they were separate. They were practicing their religion. In fact, in fact, they were really trying to get the law right. And so if the law was here, they said, we've broken the law so many times, we're going to build a fence around the law so that... If we keep these traditions, we will not break this because, man, we keep on breaking this law over and over and over again. That's why Jesus had to come, to fulfill the law, because we couldn't do it on our own. In the first century, uh, another way that people would attempt to create hope, peace, and freedom was government. We don't do that today, do we? In the first century, with that government, you had people like the Sadducees and the Herodians, And these people weren't bad. They were realist. They said, listen, we're under the thumb of Rome. We got to have some order here, okay? There might be a little bit of a puppet government, but we're going to work with this. We're going to work within what's really going on here. And in our day and age, you know, sometimes it's like, well, if if we just have the right person, if we just have the right person in, in the presidency, if we just have the right person in Congress, if we just have the right people in the Senate, everything will be fine, But we live in a world of darkness where motivations are tested and and ultimately, we still have to look to God for that light. Another way that people look to create hope, peace, and freedom is by force. These are the people who they have practiced maybe religion and they've, they've tried to do government and they say, listen, if we could just start over again everything would follow. They don't know what they're doing and they don't know what they're doing and they don't know what they're doing, but if we did it, it would be perfect. And we've seen this from generation to generation to generation for hundreds, thousands of years. If if we were in charge, and unfortunately, we all have clay feet We all have clay feet, and we all fall short of the glory of God. And so we're not able to set up a perfect kingdom of light. And the fourth way that we oftentimes try to create hope, peace, and freedom, it's simply withdrawing. I'm just going to go over here, and I'm going to do my own thing. And in the first century, this was a group known as the Essenes. You may have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is the group who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls in the desert. Oftentimes we can feel like, you know, 
If I would just be like the desert monks, if I could just get away into the desert, then everything I would have, I'd have hope. I'd have freedom. I'd have peace. And you know what you find out when you read of the desert fathers? When you read of monks in antiquity who would go and do this when left alone, they were even more aware of the sin in their heart. They became more aware that they needed God just as much today as when they first began walking with Him. Even more, even more, we have to rely on Him. We try to attempt to create hope, freedom, peace. But ultimately, the only true great expectation that we can ever have for these things is found in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Messiah who we celebrate at Christmas coming into the world. God himself is the one who has given and created. Although Jesus has always been, he is God incarnate. God sent him into the world. As it says in John 3, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God looked at the landscape and he said, You can't do this on your own. I'm going to have to come down. And this was a plan from the beginning. And he sent his son to die for you and for me and for the world. And all we have to do is accept that message. All we have to do is recognize what God has already done. So this morning, as we come to our What Now God moment, I want to encourage you this Christmas season to get ready for the power and the glory and the story of Christmas Day. Don't miss it. Don't miss what God is trying to do because each step we take toward the manger is a step towards real hope, real freedom, and real peace. You know, in this world, it's really easy to, as it were, come across something that we think is a real gift, but it's really just Legos. We're just going to stumble on that things that maybe we don't appreciate or maybe we simply have some brokenness and what we have to begin to do is we need to look at the gift of Jesus the light of the world this morning if you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior if you've never been in the waters of baptism I want to encourage you take that step don't let this season go by without responding grace of God in Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask, we ask that you would help us to see with new eyes and a new heart what you are doing in our midst right now in an already but not yet kingdom. We thank you that you son, sent your son Jesus into those, this world. We thank you that you came yourself to die in our place, that we can live in the light of the gospel message be with you for all eternity. We pray thanking you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.